Kulandera basaya mo kondera siki yeshishola he he nani otso shokoye kekeve jiajia biadida goi goi ni 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 akanya kalo koye se 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 hush 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 masaya budoya bedil tatina mishinde biadida bikoye moko kalo gusora basori besinde kashkanda kakai loloi ije iwash hahai no nyonya anyala gasandi se sinde se se. Who could you go by your book? Conda catata lali yetienda, Bushkutoya, Nasa Sasande ki shishisha, Hului, hahai, hineninian, Kaikai, woyoyo yo rushisha, Hallelujah. Oh, my children, listen to me. I'm the Lord your God. My word is perfect. Obey it. I've given you ears to hear. Receive my word. Plant it deep in you. Hold, hold on. This is the time. The time has come. It's time for us to lay all our plans aside. Our Father is asking us to trust him. He says, trust me. Look to me. Look to me. Don't trust anything you see out there. Pay no mind to anything you see out there. Listen to me. Look at me. Learn from me. I will teach you how. I will teach you how to go in my plan and walk in my plan and have total victory. This is the time. This is the time. The time is now for you to let me show you how. This is the time. The time is here for you to grab my word and to hold it dear. Just hold on to what my word has to say. Live in my word. Trust my word. I'll show you how. This is the time. The time is now. Let go of your plan and let me show you how. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to live free in 2023. That charge was not by accident. I have given you pastors that know my heart, that know you, and we, they, we and they want you to live free in 2023. Lay aside every weight. Lay aside every plan. Lay aside in, every, anything that you have need of. Lay it aside and bring it to me. Listen, listen to my word. I will plant the seed in your heart and it will grow, and it will prosper, and you will live free in 23. Lord, we worship you and praise you. Lord, we thank you for your plan being fulfilled in our lives. We thank you that your word is perfect. We thank you that as your word is planted in our heart, the incorruptible seed, Lord, that we will lay hold of everything that you've called us to do and to be, that we choose to cast away those distractions. We do believe that the time is now. We believe that we are well able through your word to live free in 23 and beyond. And Lord, we thank you that we will neither be dismayed nor fear. Glory to you, Lord, that your word brings freedom to us. And Lord, we worship you. And we praise you. We glorify you. Lord, whatever plans that we've made for ourselves, we, we roll our works upon you. 
And we trust you, Lord, that you will cause our thoughts to become agreeable to your will. And so shall our plans be established and succeed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We worship you and praise you. We glorify you. You are the one true living God. And Lord, I thank you. I thank you that we are obedient to your word. I thank you, Lord, that we choose to cast aside every weight and distraction and to set you on the throne of our heart, that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You are the one who perfects that which concerns us. And we won't pick it back up again. I thank you, Lord. And I thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit who brings these things to our remembrance. We praise you. We thank you, Lord. We magnify you. The Spirit of the Lord is present to heal you all. Whatever it is right now, just receive it. Receive by faith. I speak strength into bodies right now in the name of Jesus. Somebody struggling with pain in your right shoulder? Your right shoulder? Come on. Let me, let me pray for you. Clearly, the Lord wants that taken care of, right? I'm sure. Clearly, the Lord wants that taken care of. Yes, he called you out for sure. it. In the name of Jesus, I command restoration into the shoulder right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Lord, we worship and praise you. Glory, glory. It might not just be a physical healing that you have need of. And just because I didn't call it doesn't mean that the Lord doesn't want you to walk in health and divine healing. Right now, receive everything that God has for you. Lift it up to him and allow him to minister to that need. He has stopped everything just to minister to you, his child, right now. Lord, we honor you and praise you. Lord, we worship you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory. How do you want to do this, Lord? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We praise you and thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Bless you, Lord. Magnify the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That is in this house. It will go forth from here and it will touch the nations. We will hear of it and we will rejoice. That is not all that I've called this house to accomplish. But that will be accomplished. That will go forth. That will not come back to me more. But it will accomplish exactly what I sent it forth to accomplish. And you will rejoice. Hallelujah, Lord. Lord, we receive that as the word of the prophet in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we receive that. And we'll walk in it. Every joint supplying joint. If this house is called, which it is, to prosper at that level, that means that you're called to prosper at that level for this house to do it. Do you understand? That this body comes together in order to fulfill that prophecy. That means you have to prosper. Lay hold of it in Jesus' name. Lay hold of it. We lay hold of it and I lay hold of that in Jesus' name. Lord, that we will fund the gospel all over the world. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord, I thank you that when I speak, I'll speak as the oracles of God. That as I minister, I'll do it with the ability that you supply. That in all things, that you alone are glorified. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now listen, there is a lot to rejoice about already. You understand? Now, we don't just rejoice over the prosperity that just came forth, but we also rejoice that God's word is perfect. It is incorruptible. That he would, as we plant his in our heart, we're going to see those things come to pass, not just in the financial realm. You understand? God wanted John's shoulder taken care of. And if you had a right shoulder issue and didn't respond, then repent to the Lord and lay hold of that too. Amen? God cares about the details. And he wanted us to know the time is right now. Right? Right now. And we have to, we have to choose to allow God to be God. The only agenda that we can have is to see his will fulfilled. Yes and amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you living free in 23? Yes. <clears throat> if you're not, there's still time. Yes. Don't get discouraged. But, but it's only March, but it's already March, right? So, so we, need to, we need to make sure that if we're going to lay hold of what God has for us, that we start to truly press in for what the Lord has for us. And in order for us to do that, One of the things that we talked about is that we have to permit the Lord to show us areas of bondage in our lives that we may not even realize are areas of bondage, and then we need to allow him to paint the picture of what freedom looks like, right? Because, and we we talked about, just because something's normal to you does not make it right. (sighs) Okay. Okay. So, so I work, um, I work, those of you who don't know, I work at a police department. I am a victim advocate at work and I work with a lot of people who are victims of domestic violence. And so, and Rose will tell you that this is a very true story. Uh, when we talk to people who have been uh, a victim of domestic violence, we call, I'm educating them on the criminal justice process and I'm putting them in touch with resources. I don't do counseling. So... I make phone calls very often where I get told, well, yeah, but every couple fights. No, no, not every couple lays hands on each other. That is not okay. Actually, it's illegal. 
So what might be normal to you is not necessarily right, right? And, and it's amazing what is normal in some people's minds. And the reason why it's normal is because it's just all that they know. So I know people. One thing that I know is people. I didn't say I understand them. I just said I know them, right? And one of the things that I know about people is if we've been raised a certain way, that's all that we know. And if it's all that we know, we think it's normal. But just because it's normal does not make it right. Okay? And so because it's all that we know, we don't know what freedom in that area looks like until God teaches us what freedom in that area looks like. That you can actually have a healthy marriage. You don't actually have to scream at each other to communicate. I know it's foreign for some people. I get that, and I'm not judging. I'm just telling you, it, we're supposed to have the law of love and kindness ever on our tongue and on our lips. That a soft answer turns away wrath. Right? That we're actually supposed to realize that we're in covenant with the person who we're married to, and therefore, in that covenant, we're supposed to look out for that other person's best interests. Above our own. That is actually what marriage is supposed to look like in a covenant, right? Yet, that's not normal in the world. But just because something's normal doesn't make it right. I'll go one step further. Just because something's legal doesn't make it right. You know, you know and let, let, me, let me explain what I, I... We could go so many different directions with that statement. But, but let me clarify what I mean. So... There are people who will not ever be abused for domestic violence, but they're extremely abusive because they abuse mentally, they abuse you know, emotionally, they abuse financially. There, there's different types of abuse beyond just the physical, but it's, not, the, the, we, it's a hard thing to prosecute. So, so just because it's not illegal or just because it is legal doesn't make it right. So we have to use right and we have to judge right by what is written. And so one of the things that's normal, fear, fear is normal. You know, you should have a healthy fear. No, you shouldn't. You should have no fear. But in that no fear, you don't get cocky about who you are. You get bold about who he is and that he's on the inside of you. Now, This is going to require that identity shift, right? It requires us renewing our mind to who we are in Christ because fear is something that every person deals with or gives over to, one or the other. But every single one of us is tempted by fear, and the reality is the things that that try to, to create fear in you may have no effect on me at all. But the things that affect me, you may think, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. I can give you an illustration. And I don't know how far we'll get today, but we already had some really great church. Okay, so don't don't get worried about it. So my husband was working with uh, with with a security team doing executive protection. He was out of town. I think he was in Chicago. And it's 10.30 at night, and I call him, and I'm on the phone with him, and I said, listen, uh, I'm going to stay on the phone with you. If anything goes wrong, just call, call the police department and have them dispatch an officer to the house, And because I heard something. It sounded like somebody might have broken into the house. So I'm going to clear the house. My husband says, hang up and call 911. I said, no, I don't, I don't need to do that. I'm going to clear the house, and if anything, you just you call 911. <laughs> So, yeah, okay, but I'm going to tell you about two weeks later. So, so I clear the house. He, he's, I don't know why my husband puts me on speakerphone when he's with his team, but sometimes he does. I wasn't, wasn't aware until this happened that he did it. But uh, So I clear the house. You know, everything's fine. I don't know what the noise was. I still don't know what the noise was, but there was an empty lot beside my house, so probably something hit my house. I don't know. Um, so... Everything's fine. 
I go to sleep, world is good, okay? Now, some of you may not have slept that night, right? Because there was noise in the house. I don't know, maybe you would have called 911. So two weeks later, <clears throat> I'm laying in bed, and I realize that my three cats are not in bed with me. Why is this strange, you wonder? Because my nocturnal cats sleep with me at night, mostly on me. And so uh, it was very noticeable to me that as I'm getting ready to go to sleep, they are not in the bed. And I'm like, where are the cats? And I was already prepared to have a toddler because I knew that if you didn't know, like if the cats weren't making noise, you go check on them. Yeah. So I was already prepared for motherhood with these cats, right? So I go out and I, I, I have my phone and I'm using my flashlight to not turn on all the lights and I go down the hallway and there are the three cats circling a snake. Okay, in full disclosure, in full disclosure, the, pet, the, the, the snake is a little bit bigger girth than the pen, okay? It's like the size of a regular Sharpie, all right? But I don't know how long this thing is because it's coiled up looking like it's going to strike and it looks mean. And it's not just a regular black snake. So back I am on the phone with my husband at 1030 at night. Well, he's with the same team, but now he's in Atlanta. And... I call him and I said, listen, I got to call the cops. And he said, for what? I said, there's a snake in the house. He said, you are not calling the cops for a snake. I said, yes, I am. These are my coworkers. I happen to know for a fact you respond to snake in the house calls. I'm calling them. No, call Curtis. I said, I am not calling Curtis. It is 1040 at night and I'm not calling him at 1040 at night for a snake in the house. I'm calling the cops. You are not calling the cops. Go get a sword. <laughs> Do not use the gun because if it ricochets off the tile, we're going to have a problem. Go get the sword. Did I say there were three cats surrounding the snake? So now I don't question the sword like you and your mind are questioning as you're laughing at me. I simply say, now I've got to get the cats into the room so that when I get the sword, I don't hit a cat. So I start getting the cat. First, I have to find a way to trap the snake because I can't afford for the cats to not be guarding the snake and the snake to go away. I mentioned it's not just a simple black snake, right? It's got markings. I don't... Listen, it could have been a pygmy rattlesnake. I don't know what it was at the time, okay? Stop laughing at me. So <clears throat> anyway, I go through all of this. I don't know why my husband didn't say get a broom. I don't know, but it wasn't an option at the time. The sword was the option, right? So our goal is to get the sword. Anyway, long story short, I get the snake out of the house because it wedged itself into a picture frame. So it goes out of the house and all is well. I'm still on speakerphone, by the way. And now my husband's team is laughing at me. And I'm like, I do not understand why people are laughing right now. This is not a laughing matter. He said, this is the same team that was on speakerphone two weeks ago when you were willing to shoot a person for breaking in the house and you've got a little snake in the house and you're freaking out. Do you understand that people have different things that they have fears about? Do you know I was not going to sleep while there was a snake in my house? Person, no problem. We got this. See, the, now Rachel, Rachel would be like, why didn't you call me? i just come play with it. No, you get it out of my house, right? Here, here's the reality. We all have different experiences in our lives. So the things that might cause me to have any temptation of fear may have nothing to do with you. Rachel laughs in the face of snakes. And it was just, it was just little. I mean, it, was, it wasn't little. It was like that long. Okay, it was a snake. And again, it wasn't... The, everybody knows that a black racer is fine, right? It's like, hey, not a problem. It's a black racer. It's a Florida snake. It might bite, but you're not going to... It's not deadly. 
This had markings on it. Turns out it was a corn snake. I don't know why it was in my house. It's not invited. Not welcome. Okay? Bottom line is different things tempt different people with fear. But we're all solicited with fear. Every single one of us has to deal with fears that come to, to, to solicit us. Fear entered in at the garden. Romans 8, 2 <clears throat> says, The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. When did the law of sin and death enter in? At the fall, when Adam and Eve fell in, this, in the garden, that's where sin entered in. With sin accompanied it fear. What is the first thing Adam responds to God when God says, Adam, where are you? He says, I hid myself because I was afraid. Fear entered in. And ever since that moment to this, until Jesus returns, fear is a dominating force in the earth. People say, well, you should have a healthy fear. No, you should not. There is no healthy fear. It's not a healthy fear. Now, you should be so in tune with the spirit of God that you know if there's a scratch on the inside of you or a check or something saying, don't do this. But it shouldn't be fear because we shouldn't be led by fear. We should be led by the spirit of God. And the spirit of God will tell you if there's danger. He will tell you. You know, I, I use the example. I guess we're having a storytelling anointing this morning, too. We had it last night. All right. Hallelujah. I, and I've shared this before, but years ago, we had a, a woman who, um, she was a born-again believer, spirit-filled, prayed in, prayed in the spirit, but she was a victim of a crime. I came to respond. Uh, she was um, held up at gunpoint of a sawed off shotgun in her face when she was arriving at work at Publix and they stole her wallet and took off. So I get called because she's traumatized. Fair enough. It's a good reason to call me. So I get called out and I start talking to the woman because she's like, because one of the first things she just utters out to me is, I don't understand this. I pray Psalm 91 every day. And I said, okay, well, then let's talk about that. Because Psalm 91 is a prayer of protect, protection. And we lay hold of protection when we, when we are praying that out. And so I said, well, let's, let's talk about this. And so she does. She starts to tell me, well, I said, what happened yesterday? Well, you know, I really, you know, I, I just kept thinking, you know, I'm not going to go to work tomorrow. But then I was thinking, well, I don't know why I wouldn't go to work. I feel fine. I don't, I'm not sick. Why would I call in sick when I'm not sick? And really, everybody's day gets messed up if I call in, because if I call in, then the manager's got to do extra duties and everything before the store can open. And she's reasoning everything out. I'm like, okay. And then she goes on, and she's like, yeah, and then last night I even said to my dad, I'm like, you know, dad, I, for some reason, I just don't think I should go to work tomorrow. And he's like, well, are you feeling all right? Yeah, I feel fine. It's just weird. I, like, I just... And then so she got up that morning, and she's like, well, you know. And she reasoned it out, and she went to work because of all of the reasons why she should go to work, right? Going to work's the right thing to do, right? And it wasn't fear. She had no fear working on the inside of her. She just had this nagging, I shouldn't go to work today. Well, guess what? She shouldn't have went to work that day. Do you know what would have happened if she didn't? work that day? She would have no idea why she didn't go to work that day because she wouldn't have had a sawed off shotgun held in her face. She wouldn't know why, but Psalm 91 was working in her life. The spirit of God was working on the inside of her, not through fear. Oh, something bad's going to happen if you just override this. No, just, Hey, listen, don't go. But we all want to understand why. And listen, I'm getting in charge. I get it. My husband's like, could you just listen without having to know why? I'm working on it. <laughs> I, I am. I am. Uh, no, I'm serious. I'm working on it. It is a character flaw for me. I got to know why. It's not good to have to know why. I'm just telling you. That, that woman needed to know why, and then she was a victim of a crime. Okay. 
that was not God leading by The fear came because she overrode the unction on the inside of her. Not by God. God didn't lead by fear. God does not lead by fear. God doesn't solicit you with fear. He sets before you life and death, blessings and curses. He tells you, choose life that you and your seed may live, but he doesn't force you. He doesn't say, oh, but look, you're going to die. No, he set before you both choices. And he said, you choose. It's up to you. What do you want to do? Right? Because his heart's desire is for us to just listen to him, obey him. You know, there is life in obeying. There is goodness in obeying. And God bless God because I can't imagine how I frustrate him sometimes. Because <clears throat> now that I have a two-year-old and she thinks that she knows better than me in so many things. And I'm like, baby, but if you do this, you can have that. But you have to do this first, right? And, and I do that to God. And I'm like, but no, let's just do this. And he's like, no, no, no. Do what I say, and that'll be added. So maybe you don't frustrate God. Maybe it's just me. But you are welcome to eavesdrop on me preaching to myself. How's that? Is that all right? So Isaiah 43, 1. <clears throat> Isaiah 43, 1 tells us, he says, fear not. Now, in the Bible, there's 365 times that you're told to fear not, be not afraid, um, have no fear. 43, 1. And... Um, so he's trying to get something over to us. Every day he wants us to have no fear. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. Can you say I'm redeemed? How did you get redeemed? How did you get redeemed? By accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, right? That, that you, did you do something magnificent? Did you earn it? You were simply redeemed because you were purchased with a price. The price that Jesus paid was the, his own shed blood. He poured out his blood in front of the mercy seat of God so that you could be redeemed, bought back from the sin that you were sold into. You couldn't pay the price. You don't have what it takes. He redeemed you. He goes further. He says, fear not for I have redeemed you. There was a price paid and the price that was paid was amazing. It was awesome. It was unmeasurable. Fear not for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. I've called you by name. You didn't just get grouped in. This was not like a group, okay, let's just save group A, and then we're going to save group B, and you just kind of slid in. Nope. He called you by name. Do you know he knows your name? Yes. You know the funny thing is, people's names are important to them. You might, no, my name's not important to you. Yes, it is. Let somebody mispronounce it. I don't know why. I spell my name with a Y because my family spells my name with a Y. Because I'm a Teresa, but don't you dare call me Teresa because I only got called Teresa when I was being reprimanded. <clears throat> so as beautiful as my name is, you're not permitted to use it. But I'm a Terry because my mom spells her name with a Y. My Aunt Terry spelled her name with a Y. And so everybody's like, well, men spell their name with a Y. So do I. And amazing, when I send emails and my signature line has my name there twice at work, it's got my name printed, like I sign it, and then it's got a signature line. It's got my name written. I'm the one who created the email. Me, I did not misspell my name. 
Yeah, I can't tell you the number of times people hit reply and then put an I or chop off an R. They, and, and I'm like, but it's not your name to change. Why are you changing my name? Don't you think I know how to spell my name? Your name is important to you. Do you know the shocked look on your face when I say your name to you? That you're shocked that I know your name. Dee is laughing because she was so shocked Pastor Kurt knew her name, she almost fell down. She's like, Pastor knew my name. Yes, your name is important. And for somebody who loves you to call your name, you may not realize how precious it is, but it's precious. And you may not realize how much God loves you, but you are so important to him that he called you by name. When he called you, it wasn't just, there's so many pictures that could be painted in our heart that would, that would diminish the value of, him be, for, of us being called. Like it could just be, well, yeah, he just wants a family. He's just going to take everybody. No, 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 no. He called you by name. You are so valuable and so important. God knows you by name. And, and he, the names that he calls you are kind, loving, gentle. He calls you by name because he loves you with an everlasting love. He calls you by name because he wants you to know you don't have to be afraid. I know who you are. You know, there's so much power in him calling you by name and then telling you, you are mine. You are mine. What is there to be afraid of when you're his? Okay. Yeah, but you don't know what I'm going through. Yeah, but you're his. See, there's an identity shift that happens when you start to realize he said, you are mine. I am yours. There's this mutual exchange that happens. You are mine and I am yours. You belong to me, but I belong to you. You're a part of this family now, and every benefit of being a part of this family is yours. You know, there are benefits to Victoria for being our child. Now, there's, there's a price to be paid for being a pastor's child. There is. There, people put higher expectations on her. People think that she's going to be absolutely like never going to do anything wrong. She's still in a human body like you are, like I am, right? We cannot expect my child to be absolutely perfect in everything all of the time. She deals with flesh, okay? Now, we're going to teach her to crucify flesh, right? But she's two, But then there's a lot of benefits to being the pastor's kid. Do you understand? And that, that pales in comparison to the benefit of being a child of the living God. He said, fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. Why shouldn't you fear? Because God's redeemed me. He knows my name, and I am his. Does, will fear try to solicit you? Yes. How will you combat that fear? Because I'm redeemed. He has called me by name, and I am his. Well, what does him calling me by name have to do with? He can get my attention at any time. I don't have to be afraid. What is there to fear? You know, fear is, fear is expecting God's promise to fail. That's the bottom line. You know, Pastor Kurt totally debunked the whole fear is the false evidence of appearing real statement. It's a cute saying, but it's not true. 
Because a real gun at your real head with real bullets in it and a real trigger <clears throat> is not fake. It's not false evidence, right? A car coming at you is not false evidence, appearing real, right? A dog getting to bite you is not false evidence, appearing real. When fear shows up in those instances, one of God's promises has to fail in order for you to fall victim of that weapon, right? No weapon formed against me shall prosper has to fail for the bullet to be able to pierce my head, for the car to be able to hit me, or the dog to be able to bite me. So it's not false evidence appearing real because there's real evidence appearing real. It's a rear, not a fear. But when we have an expectation that God's word is not going to come to pass in our lives, that one of the promises is not true, then that's when fear comes in. Now, that fear can come in when you just don't know the promise that you need to cling to. You know, when I I used to be very allergic to yellow jackets, and as I tell the story, it seems ridiculous. I had this giant plant in front of my house that seemed to draw yellow jackets, and now I wonder why it was there as long as it was, but... um, (laughs) But what happened... I mean, because I was not a believer. I I was a believer, but I was lost as a goose in a blizzard, but... Um, cause I was like saved by the skin of my teeth, not walking with the Lord. And then, so then all these, all these yellow jackets would be at my front door, whatever season. Right. And so, you know, by then I know by his stripes, I was healed. You know, I, I, I know healing scriptures by this point and I walk out the door and I, it, it looked like this thing was just confused and it, it looked like it accidentally bumped into me, but it stung me right? And all I could do, with, the only scripture I could come out with was, no weapon formed against me shall prosper, because that stinger was a weapon. You know, I had zero reaction to that stinger. We have to believe that God's word is true and will not fail, and that will, that will purge fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Why did he give us the, pr- the promises? Because he loves us. Exactly. Listen, you've got areas of your life that you're dealing with fear in. Maybe you've tried things before. Oh, I've tried to do that and, you know, I failed or I've messed up again or I'm dealing with the same situation over and over or, or you know, what if I get rejected or what if I... You know, what if I succeed? What if I fail? What if I this? What if I that? You what if everything. And fear is trying to grab a hold of you in an area. You have to remember to fear not. You've been redeemed. God himself has called you by name and you are his. You're his. First John chapter four, we'll start in verse 16 says, for we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in God, excuse me, he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. When does the day of judgment happen? It's not at the end because he goes on and he says, as he is, so are we in this world. There is a day of judgment at the end. There is. For, for non-believers and believers, we'll have two separate judgments. But there's a day of judgment every time fear comes. There's a day of judgment every time fear solicits you. Every time a problem shows up, there is a day of judgment that goes on in your head. I haven't been doing my healing scriptures. 
I haven't, I haven't been in the word as much as I ought to. I haven't, I haven't been confessing my financial scriptures. I haven't been, I haven't been, I haven't been, I haven't been. Your day of judgment is self-condemnation. God's not condemning you. But in your head, you're experiencing judgment right now. And in that judgment, you're supposed to have boldness in that day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Well, how is he? How is Jesus right this moment? He's healed. What else is he? He's strong. He's peace. He's what? His joy. Does he have any lack at all? No. Does he have any sickness? No. Is he stressed out? No. Any worries? No. Do you know Jesus is not sitting on the throne saying, oh, this world's going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> Do you know he's not saying that because he knows his words have power and he is not sending this world to hell in a handbasket. And if anybody could, it would be him. That is not what's happening. He's up there. First of all, he's ever making intercession for us. He is healed. He is whole. He is rejoicing. He is laughing at the devil. He is fearless. He is strong. He is mighty. He's restored. He's wealthy. And so are you. So are you. It's going to take a shift in your identity. If you don't, if you, ref, if you refuse to identify with who you are, if you refuse to accept his love, love has been perfected in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. You know, Pastor Kurt tells the story about, um, a couple of weeks before he went to go train with the Israelis over in Israel, he was training to go train. <laughs> you have to. And so he was, he was training, and they were doing something on the stairs, and he, he uh, jumped, did something, landed on his ankle, and he heard a wet pop. And he calls me. Does our clinic have an x-ray machine? Not the call that you're expecting from your husband when you're in the middle of work. Yes, honey, I think it does. Okay, well, I'm going to head over there now. I'm okay. I'm healed and whole in Jesus' name. Now, this is a few minutes after he's been sitting there. He's laying on the floor, and everything starts to go in through his mind. I haven't been doing my healing scriptures enough. I haven't been doing this enough. Oh, my goodness, blah, 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 blah. Because just so you know, pastors are not exempt. We don't, we do not get an exemption from everything that you experience. We get an onslaught of extras. <clears throat> so it's going through his head and he has to remind himself, God loves me more than he hates my mistakes. God loves me more than he hates my sin. God loves me more than he hates my laziness, my omission, my disobedience. He loves me more than he hates anything that I ever do Amen. or didn't do. That's how you have boldness in the day of judgment, being so absolutely convinced that God loves you more and wants to help you out of the mistakes that you made. So anyway, they couldn't, they couldn't, ex they couldn't do an x-ray of his, his ankle that day because it was too swollen. So I don't know if it was the next day or the day after. He goes and he gets a, an x-ray. And now he's you know, just calling out for the mercy and love of God. And goes for the x-ray, and they say, well, we see where you broke it, but it's healed. Uh, exactly. When did you break this ankle? He said, I've never broken this ankle before. They said, well, this is an old injury. This is an, a new injury. He said, well, yeah, it's two days old. <laughs> because he experienced the supernatural because he leaned into the love of God. Because you can lean into your own self-condemnation. You can, you, can, you can have no boldness in the day of judgment. Or you can have boldness in the day of judgment knowing who he is and what he's done. Yeah. Verse 18 says, There is no fear in love. Not, not your love. The love that God has for you. 
If you are so absolutely convinced that God loves you so much, he will not permit something to overtake you. And you stay. You, the Jude says you have to keep yourself in the love of God. Well, how can I leave the love of God? You can absolutely pay no attention to the truth that you are loved. Yes. You can. Yes. And everything about a person who doesn't know they're loved can show on their face. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. This is not your love walk. Okay, we're going to read through this. Do not, we're not going to go to verse 19 yet. We're just going to read through this, and we're going to talk about this for a second. You guys are all comfortable, right? Okay. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Okay, people want to turn this into, well, you know, I haven't been walking in love. You are so self-absorbed that you're making this scripture about you. Stop being all about you and start realizing this is all about Jesus. Yes, we are called to love and to live like Jesus. That's why it's part of our mission, right? We are called to love like Jesus, but this isn't about your love walk. This is about his love walk. I had, I had one lady one time who she got, she was a victim of an armed robbery at a bank. And she just could not shake the fear, was so consumed with fear. Months, probably years gone by and just consumed with fear. And her understanding of this scripture was, when I walk in love, I don't have to be afraid. But, but here's the thing. Anybody ever, I don't know, not? The pastor's raising her hand. I don't know about you guys. You're all looking at me like a little judgmental. I have, there have been times I have not walked in love. That's, this scripture is not about us. This scripture is about Jesus. There is no fear in God. There is no fear in love. God is love. There is no fear in God because perfect love, understanding how much he loves you, casts out fear. I don't have to be afraid of anything because God loves me. And he, his mercy will help me when I have made a mistake. Right? Right? that we come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy in the time of need. We, can, we only go to obtain mercy when we've messed up. Amen. And we go boldly because we're confident of his love. Yes. It casts out fear because fear involves torment. There is no good parent who wants their child tormented. No good parent wants their child tormented. God is a good, good father. He does not want you in fear. He does not want you tormented. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. What does that mean? That means when you're getting solicited by fear, you reject it. You let love purge out that fear. You don't accept it. You don't receive it. You don't just give place to fear because fear is normal. Fear is normal. We're in a fallen world where the fear monger reigns. Yes. Yes. But it is not right. We don't have to give place to fear. We're all going to experience the emotion of fear. I'm not judging you. I'm telling you, don't let it have its place. Jesus said, you got no place in me. Right? When the devil comes to solicit, you, you, that, he's got nothing in me. He's got nothing in you because the greater one lives on the inside of you. He doesn't fit where the God is. And you do not have to fear. You have to be so convinced of God's love. Now, maybe next week, because really God can do whatever he wants to. <clears throat> He's my boss. I ain't his. So maybe next week we're going to get a little deeper into this because fear is something that we have to be free from in order to walk free in 23. 
And there's a lot of things, there's a lot of different areas, and we're going to do broad strokes because the principles that are written in the Word of God are true regardless of what the specific fear is in your life. You know, maybe you don't, you know, I was, I was given an illustration that, that somebody's husband, you know, they went from living in their parents' house to having roommates to being married, right? And then the husband started traveling, and they were like, whoa, how, and, and ask me, how do you do this? How do you, how do you, how do you, how are you okay when your husband's traveling all the time? Well, I was single for seven years after I bought my own home. I lived on my own all, like for seven years, like living on my own was normal for me. It was not a big deal. Noise, noises happen when your spouse is gone. You could have an absolute quiet house until your, 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 especially your husband, your husband travels and all of a sudden there's noisemakers in your house, Right. But for me, I had been single for seven years before we got married. I lived on my own. It wasn't an issue for me. The snake, issue. (laughs) You understand? Different solicitations, different responses, different past experiences affect how we see things now. So we're going to talk about them a little bit so we can get it purged out and let God's love purge that fear out of us. Amen? Amen. Minister Curtis is going to come up and give everybody an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ, their personal Lord and Savior. Wow, I said that so fast, you didn't have time to get up here. Woo! I love you all very, very much, and our heart's desire is for us to walk free in 23. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. If you receive something this morning, glory to God. If there is someone here, or maybe you're listening on the internet, and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. It says in in Romans 6, 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. You know, everybody is able to pay those wages. That's not necessarily good news. Because there's no surviving after it. But the rest of it says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if we're received, he made the payment. He paid for the sin, all of our sin for us. In our place. He did everything necessary so that all your sin are paid for. Amen. That's good news. And as a matter of fact, he did it so well that there's no sin that you will ever commit that has not been paid for. Amen. So it wasn't just your past sins. Because before you were born. Before you were born, he went to hell in your place. He paid for your sin on the cross. Before you were ever born, he was raised from the dead. Amen? And so nobody could ever say, well, it's all my past sin. Well, how is that possible? How is that possible? Because he already did it before you were ever born. Right? And so the sin he paid for was not just your past sin. It's all sin forever. All your sin forever. And so if you bow your head and close your eyes and pray this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus. I believe that you paid for my sins by dying on the cross and going to hell in my place. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. I confess with my mouth that Jesus, you are my Lord and you are my Savior. I receive you into my heart. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. I believe now I am a child of God. I am free from sin. I, am, I have eternal life. And I thank you for taking my life and doing something with it. And I praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. If you just received the Lord, if you'll see one of our bookstore attendants or one of our ushers, we have some information we want to sow in your life that's going to help in your walk. If you're listening on the Internet and you just received the Lord, if you'll send an email to connect at reallifefl.com, we have some information we'll send to you as well. Amen? Because, listen, you just walked through the door. You just got born again, become part of this family. But, you know, there's a lot of learning to do. There's a lot of growing to do. And that's why we have some information we want to give to you. Amen? Father, we thank you for the word we received this morning. We thank you, Father, for those that, have got, that just received you, that are now born again, that are part of the family of God. Lord, we rejoice with them and we rejoice with all of heaven. And we praise you, Father God, that, Lord, you have redeemed and you continue to redeem. 
And Lord, we thank you for using us, setting us up with divine appointments, Lord, as we leave this place. That, Lord, we do have something to share. We have the goodness of God that we can share with those, Lord, who've never heard of you before. And we praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you all. Have a great day.